Imagine a waterway so vast and intricate that it connects the Atlantic Ocean to the heart of North America, facilitating the passage of ships the size of skyscrapers. Well, that, my friends, is the St. Lawrence Seaway. Stretching over 2,300 miles, this body of water links U.S. states to two Canadian provinces and handles millions of tons of cargo each year. Iron ore, grain, and more, forming the backbone of trade for an entire continent. But what stories lie beneath its waters? How did this engineering marvel reshape North America's economy? And what sacrifices were made? to bring it to life. Stay tuned to find out, as today we uncover the incredible history of the St. Lawrence Seaway. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The St. Lawrence River is one of North America's most important waterways, shaping history long before the idea of the seaway even existed. It connected people, powered trade and inspired innovation. But to understand the rise of the St. Lawrence Seaway, we first need to dive into the river's early history. The St. Lawrence River flows from Lake Ontario to the Atlantic Ocean, forming part of the modern border between Canada and the US. This natural highway has been essential for centuries, supporting the livelihoods of both indigenous people and early explorers alike. Long before the concept of engineered canals and locks, even existed. The river sustained communities. In fact, it was this waterway that supplied the indigenous people with resources, as they relied on its water for food and trade. And according to some sources, these type of activities there go back a thousand years. When Europeans arrived in the Americas, the St. Lawrence became a gateway for exploration. French explorer Jacques Cartier explored the river in 1534, giving it its name after arriving on St. Lawrence feast day. He also became the first European to venture inland along the river, naming the region Canada, a name inspired by an indigenous word for settlement. His fur trading activities marked the beginnings of commerce that would define the area for generations. The Basques, fishermen and whalers from northern Spain and France, also utilized the river's resources starting in the early 1520s. They traded with indigenous people, showcasing how the river fostered cross-cultural exchange well before formal colonies were established. By the 18th century, the St. Lawrence River had become a crucial artery for trade and conflicts. During the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War in the United States, the St. Lawrence played a key role in military strategy, serving as a critical route for British and French forces. But if we move forward another century, it was this area that saw the introduction of some of the first steamboats in 1809, which transported goods and passengers between Quebec and Montreal. As industrialization took hold, Engineers sought to overcome the river's natural obstacles, though some small canals already existed and were built by the British between 1779 and 1781. In fact, these were the first lock canals in North America, allowing small boats to bypass rapids as well as other dangerous obstacles near Montreal. For larger ships, however, the Welland Canal became a game changer. Completed in 1829, it connected Lake Ontario to Lake Erie, allowing ships to bypass Niagara Falls. Over time, successive versions of the Welland Canal were built, culminating in the modern Wellship Canal built in 1932, now an integral part of the St. Lawrence Seaway. Hence, through centuries of trade, exploration, and innovation, the St. Lawrence River evolved from a natural waterway into the foundation of one of history's greatest engineering projects, a project that would forever change North America's economy and landscape. By the late 19th century, the idea of creating a formal waterway that connected the Atlantic Ocean to the heart of North America had gained traction. However, the journey to making the St. Lawrence Seaway a reality was long, complex, and filled with setbacks. The concept of a fully engineered passage, of course, wasn't entirely new. Decades earlier, projects like New York's Erie Canal had demonstrated how transformative such infrastructure could be. Opened in 1829, the Erie Canal revolutionized trade by linking the Great Lakes to the Hudson River, making it a cornerstone of commerce for nearly a century. However, as trade expanded and ship sizes grew, it became clear that a larger, deeper waterway was needed, one that could accommodate modern vessels and connect the Great Lakes directly to the ocean. And so it was. In 1985, the Canadian Deep Waterways Commission was formed to evaluate the potential for a new, 
more ambitious seaway, this effort gained international attention, and by 1909, the International Joint Commission continued the dialogue between the US and Canada. Yet despite growing interest, no formal agreement emerged. Political concerns, economic priorities, and competition from railroads and other ports repeatedly stalled progress. The 1930s brought a renewed push for the project, though, as this was the time that finally Canada and the U.S. signed a treaty of intent. But opposition from the U.S. Senate and Ontario's government halted its momentum. Critics worried that a new waterway would harm railroad infrastructure, Gulf and Atlantic ports, as well as other established trade routes. The debate intensified, with even toll proposals failing to win over skeptics. However, as time passed, despite these obstacles, support for the Seaway grew, driven by the promise of economic growth and the need for modern infrastructure. By 1936, influential groups like the Great Lakes Harbor Association and the Great Lakes Tidewater Commission brought the case for the Seaway directly to President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Advocates pointed out how it could boost trade, especially for commodities like grain. Talks resumed in 1940, but once again, the U.S. Congress remained unconvinced, fearing economic disruption in other regions, which remained the case until World War II, which unexpectedly underscored the strategic importance of the St. Lawrence River. You see, during the Battle of St. Lawrence, German submarines targeted Allied ships, disrupting both military and commercial operations. This wartime vulnerability reminded leaders of the need for a modernized and secure waterway. After the war, Canada decided to move forward independently, with their Prime Minister championing the project, emphasizing the importance of hydroelectric power and national pride. In 1951, the Canadian Parliament created the St. Lawrence Seaway Authority to oversee the endeavor. Not long after, momentum shifted in the U.S. as well, recognizing the potential for accessing Canada's rich iron resources. President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the Seaway Act in 1954. This act established the St. Lawrence Seaway Development Corporation and committed the U.S. to sharing the cost of the construction. Canada agreed to fund the majority of the project, covering $336.5 million of the $470.3 million total, while the U.S. contributed $133.8 million. With agreements in place and funding secured, construction began. The Seaway would soon become one of the most ambitious engineering collaborations between two nations. Ceremonies marked the groundbreaking, signaling a new era of cooperation between Canada and the U.S. Years of political debates and logistical challenges gave way to the labor and ingenuity needed to bring the St. Lawrence Seaway to life. It was a bold undertaking that promised to reshape North America and redefine the waterways that long served as its lifeline. But the path to progress wasn't without sacrifices. The construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway was a massive endeavor that required cutting-edge engineering, thousands of workers, and a vision to connect the Great Lakes to the world. Over 22,000 workers took part in the project, moving millions of cubic yards of rock and concrete to shape one of the most ambitious waterways in history. The Seaway comprises of two main sections, the Well End Canal, which connects Lake Ontario to Lake Erie, and the newer portion stretching from Montreal to Lake Ontario. Together, these two sections form a 15-lock system that links the Atlantic Ocean to the heart of North America. During construction, engineers faced a unique challenge of ensuring the new locks aligned with the existing infrastructure of the Welland Canal. Built decades earlier, the Welland locks had size constraints that the new locks had to account for, ensuring seamless navigation for ships traveling inland. But beyond altering the waterways, the project required reshaping the surrounding land. In Montreal, four bridges were modified in 1954 to allow larger vessels to pass safely. But it wasn't easy and such achievements came with many sacrifices. One of the most tragic outcomes of the construction project was the flooding of the lost villages. Ten communities permanently submerged to make way for the Moses Saunders Power Dam. Thousands of residents were relocated to towns like Longsalt and Ingleside with compensation offered for their losses. However, disputes over property values and emotional ties to their homes left a lingering sense of loss. On July the 1st, 1958, the coffer dam holding back the waterway was destroyed and the villages disappeared beneath the rising water. But these challenges aside, 
the seaway was completed with remarkable speed. By 1959, the Great Lakes region was connected to the world with a waterway capable of supporting global trade. The grand opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959 marked the dawn of a new era for trade and transportation. The world watched as the first ship traversed this engineering marvel, paving the way for economic transformation. The official opening ceremonies on June the 26th, 1959 were a spectacle of international collaboration. Queen Elizabeth II and President Dwight D. Eisenhower presided over the event, emphasizing the seaway's importance as a joint achievement between Canada and the US. The following day, more ceremonies continued in New York with Vice President Richard Nixon also in attendance. The impact was immediate. Trade boomed as iron ore, limestone, coal, and grain flowed into the Great Lakes region, fueling industries, expanding settlements, and providing economic opportunities for millions. Farmers, factory workers, and mariners alike benefited from the surge in goods reaching the interior of North America. But not every region thrived. For example, the Erie Canal, once a cornerstone of U.S. commerce, was rendered obsolete by the seaway's efficiency, and towns along that canal faced immediate economic decline, with commercial hauling ceasing entirely by 1994. Well, it has since been repurposed for recreation, the story of that canal is a good reminder of how progress in one area can mean the decline of another. The St. Lawrence Seaway was an undoubtable triumph during its prime, transforming the Great Lakes into a global trade hub, but as you might imagine, no achievement lasts forever. For decades, the St. Lawrence Seaway was the cornerstone of North American trade. Anniversaries marked its achievements and updates like the rehabilitation of the Welland Canal in the 1980s and the establishment of nonprofit management in Canada through the St. Lawrence Seaway Management Corporation in 1998 aimed to keep it competitive. Additionally, the Water Resource Development Act further bolstered U.S. operations by transitioning the seaway to an appropriated agency without sea tolls. Yet, as global trade evolved into the 21st century, the seaway's importance still began to wane. Shifting priorities, changing industries, and new trade routes gradually eroded its dominance. In other words, this decline is tied to a broader shift in international trade. Well, it was once a vital artery for trade between Europe and North America. The US now focuses more heavily on trade with South America, Africa, and Asia, meaning ports on the West Coast and southern United States have gained prominence, as they are closer to these regions and better suited for modern shipping demands. Though the seaway remains operational, its role has become more specialized rather than central to the flow of global commerce. But the decline isn't just about geography. It's also about changing industries and technologies. One key factor is the shrinking of the steel industry in the Great Lakes region. For decades, iron ore was a cornerstone of shipments through the seaway, but the rise of recycling and scrap metal has significantly reduced the demand for fresh iron. So as the region's steel industry contracted, so too did the need for raw materials transported via this passage. Furthermore, the decline of coal as a dominant energy source has brought the same effect. Once a critical commodity shipped through its locks, coal has been sidelined by the push for renewable energy and natural gas. This shift represents not just a regional trend, but a global one, as environmental priorities in particular drive change. Though it should be emphasized that the seaway still plays a role in North American trade. In 2022, for example, 36.2 million tons of cargo moved through its locks, a notable figure, but far below the 222 million tons moved in 2002. This is a stark contrast, but it presents the challenges the seaway faces in maintaining its relevance in a rapidly changing world. We'll leave it there for today, but a special thanks to our Patreons for supporting the channel. I hope the rest of you will consider joining us over there sometime soon. Information's in the description and the pinned comment. Otherwise, as always, I thank you for watching. This is Ryan Sokash, signing off.